Hello, everybody. Here we are, blessed with yet another opportunity to study God's Word together via WOW Live. Word on Wednesdays Live. Tonight we are in our 12th lesson in the series, Daniel, Prophet in Exile. And once again, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to focus on just the last two verses there, verses 26 and 27. But don't go thinking you're going to be done in 10 minutes or something. So anyway, last week we looked at Daniel's prayer in the first part of chapter 9, and he confessed the sins of his people there, the Jews, and included himself in that confession. The sins that had brought judgment on them, their idolatry, and so forth. God used Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, as the arm of his judgment in taking these people captive. And God told the prophet Jeremiah that this exile in Babylon would last for 70 years. And by the time of the events in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel knew that this Babylonian exile was just about finished. And so that's why he was praying, so the people would be clear to go back into the land. But he didn't get to finish his prayer. The angel Gabriel came to inform Daniel about 70 weeks, or 70 sets of seven years each, that God had determined for Daniel's people Israel. God was not through with the Jews at all. He had not forgotten his people. He did not forget his promises made to Abraham and to David, nor has God yet abandoned Israel or those promises. He has made promises to Israel that he intends to keep, and that is one thing that makes prophecy exciting. Recall that each week was seven years long. Seventy such weeks would therefore be 490 years, and these 70 weeks of years were split up into three segments of varying lengths. The first segment was seven weeks long, or 49 years. The second segment, 62 weeks long, 434 years. And the final segment is one week long, or seven years. And we said that these years were Jewish years, which were 360 days in length. Much of our time last week was focused on the accuracy of this prophetic passage that Gabriel was giving to Daniel. Daniel was told in verse 25 that from the time of the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, would come was seven weeks and 62 weeks. And you add those together, that's a total of 69 weeks. And at seven years per week, that's 483 years. So then you multiply that by 360 days per Jewish year, uh, and you get this uh, period of time of 173,880 days. And we were using that figure because it uh, translates easily to our own calendar which we use from then on out. We learned that this 173,880 day long period began on March the 14th, 445 BC. That was when the Persian king, Artaxerxes Longimanus, issued a decree for Nehemiah to begin rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem. And without going through all the details, exactly 173,880 days later, as we saw last week, it it was April the 6th, 32 AD. And on that day, the Messiah entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey on the very first Palm Sunday, all the way from the rebuilding of Jerusalem and to Messiah the Prince, exactly accurate. The accuracy of this prophecy about these 69 weeks is is incredible. It's amazing. Now, there is one week left. And that week hasn't even yet begun. It's still in the future for us. There is one seven-year-long segment of time left of those 70 weeks of Daniel 9. And it's often called the 70th week of Daniel. And this evening, we're going to be focusing on that 70th week in some, uh, uh, with some information. I said this last week, and I want to stress it again this week. The entirety of Daniel chapter 9 
both the prayer at the beginning and the prophecy at the end, both are focused wholly and completely on the people of Israel, God's chosen nation of people. The first sentence of verse 24 emphasizes this when it says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and your city. This prophecy has nothing to do with the church at all. We cannot make this apply to the church in any fashion without doing some kind of damage to the text, twisting it to try and make it fit whatever viewpoint, preconceived idea we might happen to hold. Between the 69th week of Daniel 9 and the 70th week of of Daniel, there's this unknown block of time for the church age. It was uh, unknown because it's unknown how long it is, and the the prophets of the Old Testament never saw the church age. There are no prophecies for the church in the Old Testament. And it's been nearly 2,000 years since 32 AD. At some point shortly after the church age ends, this 70th week of Daniel will begin. During that seven-year-long period of time, the Lord God is going to focus his attention solely upon the nation of Israel. And it's vitally important that you understand this in order to rightly see what's happening during those seven years. Everything in that seven-year time is focusing on Israel. There's a, a way we used to talk about this, about God's economy. Okay, God's economy and and how he shifts that. His economy uh, all through the Old Testament and actually on through the Gospels and on into the book of Acts at some distance, all of that was uh, focused on Israel. Even in the book of Acts, at the beginning, Peter is calling for the Jews in Jerusalem to believe that Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, I should say, is their Messiah, their Christ, their anointed one. That's what they're being called to believe. It isn't until after the Apostle Paul gets started that the church age really gets underway and we have this gospel of grace. The church age is often called the age of grace as well, and that's where we're living now. And that's God's economy now. But when the church is taken out, that age of grace comes to an end doesn't mean that God is not gracious anymore, obviously, but the way he is dealing with the uh, people on earth, uh, his economy, how he's working things out, the way he's, if you would, if I put it crudely, doing business here, uh, his economy is going to change and it will shift back to a time of is focusing on Israel and convincing Israel that Jesus is indeed their Messiah, and he's coming back really, really soon for them, okay? During that 70th week. So, um, in Daniel chapter 9, you might recall that we saw there are four persons there. Four persons in Daniel chapter 9. The angel Gabriel, who comes to Daniel to give him the prophecy. Gabriel is often associated with the Messiah in the Bible. He appears here to bring message of the Messiah's coming, as we've seen in Luke chapter 1. Gabriel also delivers messages to the priest Zacharias, and then he comes to Mary, who would be the mother of Jesus. Again, speaking of the coming of the Messiah. And then, of course, there's Daniel, the other person in chapter 9, the prophet who receives this prophecy, and he's been told by Gabriel to know the prophecy and to understand it. And I think that's important for us as well. Jesus, the Messiah, is in this chapter. The Christ, the Anointed One, God the Son. Also, he's in view in Daniel chapter 9. And then there is this coming prince. We saw him before as the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 that rises up among the ten horns of that fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7. He's the Antichrist. He's the son of perdition. He's the man of sin, the beast of Revelation 13. And tonight we will especially be looking at this wicked servant of hell. At the very end of our last lesson, we looked at this first phrase from Daniel 9.26, where it says, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So this 62-week period, you have the seven weeks and then the 62 weeks, right? The 62-week period ended on the first Palm Sunday. 
By the end of that week, Jesus the Messiah was indeed cut off, meaning he was killed. He was put to death by the Romans at the behest of the Jewish leadership in Israel. And he did not die for himself. Jesus, never think of Jesus as a martyr. Jesus was not a martyr to his own cause. He died for the sake of others. He died for the sake of you. He died for my sake as well. His death was literally a sacrifice. To propitiate is the fancy term, or to appease the wrath of God. God is holy. Sin calls for him to act in wrath and judgment. Christ's offering of himself to shed his blood in his perfect body, sinless condition, on our behalf, that satisfied God's wrath for all sin. He died once for all. His satisfactory sacrifice can then be applied to the account of anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord for his salvation. We can be delivered from, we can be saved from that penalty of our sin that rightly belongs to us, but he took it on himself, rightly paying for it. In Christ, what he did in his death has accomplished for us this salvation that we have. You know, if you have never come to Christ, If you have never stepped up to tell him that you believe in him, if you've never called upon Jesus to save you, to deliver you from your sins, brother or sister, you can do so right now, right where you're at. Just confess to the Lord in prayer that you know that you've sinned, as we all have. But own your sin. You have sinned. And tell him you want to turn from your sins so that you might rely on Jesus to save you. And friend, he will. Boy, I encourage you to do that. The time seems to be growing short, which is one of the reasons I am using the uh, the subject of prophecy in my lessons. Because I think we need to know these things. There's more to be found in verse 26. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now it's here that we're introduced to this fourth person in this chapter, this coming prince. We aren't given any details about him in this verse. We just find out he's there. We know that this uh, phrase, uh, the the, uh, prince who is to come, it's not speaking about the Messiah. The Messiah has been cut off. From elsewhere in Daniel, we have seen how the Messiah will return to set up his kingdom. But this, in Daniel 26, it's not that. From the way this verse reads, the prince who is to come is not taking any action right here in this verse. In fact, he's not even really on the scene in verse 26, if you put it in a historical context of when this is happening. The prince, you see, he's not the active agent here. It is the people of the prince who is to come. They are the ones who are acting here in this verse. Gabriel tells Daniel, the people of the prince, of the coming prince, they will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, Daniel had been told that 70 weeks were determined for his people and his city. So from Daniel's perspective, the city here in verse 26 would be his city, meaning the city of Jerusalem. And then following on that, the sanctuary would therefore have to be the temple in Jerusalem. So these people of this prince who would one day come, they're going to destroy Jerusalem and especially the temple within. This was going to happen after Jesus the Messiah went to the cross. We saw last week that Jesus entered Jerusalem on April the 6th, 32 AD. On Friday, April the 11th, Jesus the Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. 38 years later, In April of 70 AD, around the time of the Passover, the same time of year that Jesus had been crucified 38 years earlier, 
The Roman general Titus besieged the city of Jerusalem, and then by August 70 AD, the Romans had gotten through Jerusalem's last defenses, and they massacred much of the remaining population. The image that you see on here is from the Titus Arch in Rome. It portrays Titus' triumphal march into Rome after conquering Jerusalem. And the army is carrying implements from the temple, the table of showbread. You can see very clearly the seven-branched candlestick and also some ceremonial horns that they were carrying in, things they had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. And there's a big arch there in Rome commemorating that built just a few years after it happened. More than 500 years before it happened, the angel Gabriel told Daniel that the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This prophecy is given, and those people were the Romans under General Titus of 70 AD. The people of the prince that shall come. A few days before he was crucified, Jesus spoke to his disciples about the coming destruction of the temple as well. Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2. Then Jesus went out, and he departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. They were commenting, you know, look how beautiful it is. Isn't it marvelous? What a wondrous thing we have in Jerusalem. And Jesus, verse 2, said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. The western wall, also called the Wailing Wall, is the only thing that, still, that is still standing from that Roman siege and massacre. As Jesus prophesied, all the walls were torn down, not one stone left upon another. This is the only thing left is that wall. If the people of the prince that shall come were Roman people, then it stands to reason that this coming prince will himself be a representative of the lands and the nations which were once part of that old Roman empire. He's coming up out of those ten horns in Daniel chapter 7, that fourth beast. Back in early March, when, when we studied Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream about the great image, I shared this quote with you from Miller's New American Commentary on the book of Daniel. And it tells about the incredible time frame of this Roman domination in the world. It's quite amazing. Uh, Rome ruled the nations with an iron hand. And like a huge iron club, shattered all who resisted its will. The Roman Empire dominated the world from the defeat of Carthage in 146 BC to the division of the East and West Empires in AD 395, approximately 500 years later or 500 years. The last Roman emperor ruled in the West until AD 476. And the eastern division of the empire continued until A.D. 1453. So from the Roman defeat of Carthage in 146 B.C. until the end of the eastern Roman Empire in 1453, that's nearly 1,600 years. Amazing that one political national entity like that could have such a far-reaching influence. Amazing. While ancient Rome goes back more than a millennium and a half from our day, ancient Rome, that collapse of the Eastern Division was only about 570 years ago, give or take a few years. And in the grand scheme of things, 570 years isn't really that long at all. And the impact of the Roman Empire is still felt today. That's why it's not difficult to imagine that there's going to be a, a revived Roman Empire in our time. 
Now, of course, it's going to look different than the ancient Roman Empire, more modern, obviously, more technologically advanced and more connected and everything else, much, much cleaner. Uh, the Romans' roads today will be on the Internet, that kind of thing. But the basic essence of it is going to be exactly the same. A centralized government set out, in this case, to rule the world. A global one world government under the rule of the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 also called the coming prince of Daniel 9 a one world government that's been the goal of human beings for a long time everybody trying to start an empire tried to conquer the world they all failed but it's still the goal of human beings today. There's still people who want to run the world, and they're finding it easier to do now than it's ever been. There's someone else who wants to rule this world, and that's Satan. He wants his kingdom, wants it established here as his permanently. The end of verse 26 says that the end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. The focus is on Jerusalem here. And so the end of Jerusalem shall be with the flood. The analogy of a flood is like the flooding numbers of large armies which overwhelm Jerusalem and uh, Israel and Jerusalem after the Romans destroyed the city and the temple. For, for centuries, this kind of thing happens. John Wolverd confirms this in his commentary. He says the same expression of an overflowing flood is used to denote warlike hosts who annihilate their enemies. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 10, 22, 26, and 40, and in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8. This seems to be a general reference to the fact that from the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, Trouble, war, and desolation will be the normal experience of the people of Israel and will end only at the decreed end mentioned in verse 27. That is the very end of the 70th seven. History has certainly corroborated this prophecy for not only was Jerusalem destroyed, but the entire civilization of the Jews in the land of Judea ceased to exist soon after the end of the 69th 7, and that desolation continued until recent times. See, the land was therefore desolate because the people to whom it had been promised by God could not occupy that land for nearly 1,900 years. So it's desolate there. But now, in our time, Israel is back in the promised land. The time is drawing near. Things are changing in major ways. Let's now look into the final verse of chapter 9. 27 and, verse, and, and the first part. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. The pronoun he there, it's reflexive. It means it refers back to someone who was mentioned earlier in the text. Now, in verse 26, we saw that the Messiah was mentioned in the beginning. But he was cut off, and he was gone from that scene at that time. The other individual mentioned in verse 26 is that prince who is to come. He wasn't on the scene in verse 26. And also, uh, that means he fits better with verse 27, as we'll see. And since this prince is closer to our pronoun he here, uh, he refers back to that prince, that coming prince. The prince who is to come will be the one who confirms a covenant with many for one week. This week is the final week of the Daniel 9 prophecy. It's the 70th week of Daniel one seven-year-long period of time. Based on a 360-day year, that would be 2,520 days, and there might be a leap day thrown in there, maybe two, depending on how it pans out. But for the record, half of 2520 is 1,260 days. That's going to be of interest momentarily, so take note of 1,200 
in 60 days. Get back to the verse there. What does it mean to confirm a covenant with many? Keeping in mind that the focus of this prophecy is on Israel, this covenant will likely, when it, when it occurs, will be relevant to Israel, which will be an existing entity at the time. This prince will be a political leader. Okay, His covenant with Israel will be an agreement. We could call it a treaty. Since verse 26 spoke of desolation and war, this covenant or treaty may well be one of peace for Israel. It seems that the little horn of Daniel 7 will negotiate a peace treaty for Israel with many other people, likely many other nations involved in this treaty as things are operating globally. Okay? However, something major happens in the middle of that seven-year period. 27b. But in the middle of the week, he, again, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. All right, this coming prince causes sacrifice and offering to cease. Now, sacrifice and offering, as far as Israel is concerned, is something germane to their temple worship. And in verse 26, well, the temple was destroyed, right, by the Romans. So how can there be worship, in any case, how can there be sacrifice and offering? But, but here we see that it, it's assumed temple worship has resumed in Jerusalem. And the only explanation is that sometime after that desolate period, after that long time when the Jews are not in the land, or the Jews haven't been there, after all that is, is over and they're back, the temple is going to be rebuilt and temple worship will have begun. But the coming prince, the little horn, speaking blasphemy, the Antichrist, the beast of Revelation 13, he then brings temple worship to an end. He has this peace treaty, and then he turns around and does this. Verse 27 finishes off, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Kind of twisted language there, a little confusing, but we'll work our way through it. We'll get it. Abominable things. Blasphemous things, like the little horn is said to speak in Daniel chapter 7. Abominable things, blasphemous things, happen in the holy temple. And there is this one who makes the temple and Jerusalem desolate. One who makes things desolate. Empty, yet again. He removes the people of the temple. Puts an end to sacrifice and offering, you see. It makes it desolate, and he does an abominable thing there. And it will remain desolate. It will remain empty of God's people of promise until the end of the 70 weeks in other words, until this consummation which is determined. Recall, these 70 weeks were determined for Daniel's city and for his people. And at the end time, at that end time of the 70 weeks, uh, uh, comes about by a pouring out of the des upon the desolate. Uh, it says that there's going to be a pouring out upon the desolate. You know, it sounds to me like that desolation that emptiness will at that time be refilled to overflowing because the Messiah returns to set up his kingdom. What a day that's going to be. That's the end, the final end of those 70 weeks. <laughs> but let's focus again now on this. On when this coming prince is going to end this temple worship in the middle of the week, in the midst of that seven-year period. We saw earlier how Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 the destruction of the temple by the Romans. Let's now look at how Jesus also talks about the abomination in that temple that will take place. First, uh, after he prophesied about the destruction of the temple, Jesus' disciples ask him about the timing of the destruction of Herod's temple, of his coming into his kingdom, and they ask about the end of Gentile rule over Jerusalem. 
Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now see, think about this. Jesus has told them that the temple is going to be destroyed. Now see, this fact messed up the scenario that they had in their minds, the way they pictured things were going to be, because they thought Jesus, at that point, was just days away from going on into Jerusalem, taking his throne back as the Messiah, and setting up his kingdom right then and there. But apparently, since he just told them, not one stone of the temple would be left upon another stone. Apparently, Jesus has no plans in the immediate future to set up his kingdom. And so confused about this, they are asking him here for some clarification about this. In verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows." Keep in mind, everything Jesus say, is saying here uh, applies to directly or is centered upon Israel. Okay, This is not prophecy concerning the church. This is all focused. It, Israel is central to all this. I mean, when it says famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, yes, that's going to happen all over the world. Okay, The beginning of SARS, nation against nation, obviously kingdom against kingdom. But all of it is centered on Israel. Okay. It's not prophecy concerning the church. We can talk about it, know it's going to happen, and believe that, but it's not involving the church. I stress this because so many have taught this passage as though it is for the church, but it's not. At this point, the idea of the church age was a total mystery, all right? Still, the disciples are clearly thinking, uh, they're not thinking about a church and when that's going to start. They're thinking about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel by the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. That's the whole focus of their question. That's what they think is next. He tells them that many are going to come claiming to be the Messiah, uh, of, of the Messiah, to be of the Christ. Many, and many Jews are going to be taken in by this. The ultimate deception will be the Antichrist himself. That word Antichrist, by the way, means one who will take the place of Christ. It doesn't mean one who's against Christ. It means one who will take the place of Christ, a substitute Christ, an imposter, a fake. And we see here this description of things that correspond to Daniel 9.26 statement that, that the end of it shall be with a flood and until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Because Jesus tells his disciples here there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, uh, flooding into Jerusalem, attacking it. Ezekiel has a whole prophecy in, verses, in chapters 38 and 39 about an attack upon Israel and Jerusalem. We, we know ourselves that there have been many violent clashes in world history since Jesus' time here on earth. That's going to continue until he returns, as long as that land is desolate. That's why we're often encouraged to pray for the peace of Israel, because it means peace for the whole world. And then Jesus speaks about the prophet Daniel here. He says in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let, let him understand. 
Jesus is referring to what we have just read about in Daniel 9.27. In the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. That's the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke of. Israel will at some point see this abomination standing there in the holy place, in the temple. And the abomination will lead to desolation, the emptying of the temple and the city of the Jewish people. Matthew tells us in in that parenthetical comment there that whosoever reads this needs to understand it. When that abomination of desolation takes, takes its place in the temple, here's what Jesus warns the Jews of that day to do. Verses 16 to 20. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Jesus tells them, when they see this, they must not go back for anything or try to carry anything with them. Just get out. Get out. Leave. Leave Jerusalem. Flee. Don't look back. Don't go back for anything at all. Why? For then, Jesus says, then there will be... Sorry, here, let me get it. Then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. When this happens, this abomination of desolation, it's going to be the beginning of a time of great tribulation in the world. Jesus says there's never been anything like this before, nor will there ever be anything like it, ever. It's a one-of-a-kind kind of thing. We've seen some horrible things happen. We've seen some horrible things happen to Jewish people. The Holocaust uh, was terrible. Uh, you know, the Rom- well, the Romans take uh, Jerusalem, as we saw, and that was terrible. But the Holocaust runs rings around that as far as, as death and destruction and everything else. But this is even going to be worse than that. Let's now try to put together all that we have so far. Both Daniel 9 and Jesus in Matthew 24 foretell the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the people of the coming prince. And we've determined that those would be the Romans. And in the middle of the seven-year-long 70th week of Daniel, the coming prince or the Antichrist makes an end of sacrifice and offering in the temple in Jerusalem, which implies there's going to be another temple rebuilt after the one that the Romans destroyed. Jesus also implies that when he says that, when he says there's going to be uh, this abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, there is going to be another temple. When that abomination happens, says Jesus, a great tribulation will fall upon Israel. Jesus says that the Jews of that day will need to flee for their lives. So, the temple of Jesus' time was destroyed by the Romans. The Jews were exiled from their land, which had been promised to them by God, and the land has been desolated for nearly 19 centuries, ever since that time of the Romans doing what they did. But now... Israel is a nation, once again, and the Jews are back in the land. And sometime in the near future, this temple is going to be rebuilt. And the Antichrist, that coming prince, will rise as a little horn from among the ten horns of the revived Roman Empire, part of that uh, fourth beast in Daniel 7, that terrible beast, also seen as the legs of iron in Daniel chapter 2 in Nebuchadnezzar's great image, this little horn will negotiate a peace treaty between Israel and a number of other nations at the start of Daniel's 70th week. He'll seem like a good friend to Israel. But in the midst of the seven years, he'll suddenly turn on them. It made me think of this verse from Thessalonians 5, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them 
as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But he's going to commit some kind of abomination in their temple. The only hope that the Jews have in that moment is to flee the city to get and the surrounding area, get out of there, because the Antichrist will begin a time of great tribulation and, and persecution upon the Jews, unlike anything ever seen before. Now, there's another passage in the New Testament which sheds some light upon all of this. The Apostle Paul uh, writes a second letter to the church in Thessalonica. In the first letter, he talks about the rapture in chapter 4. Uh, in the second letter, he also talks about end times things. It, it turns out that in the interim, someone claiming to either be to be either under the authority of Paul or claiming to be Paul himself, someone shows up at Thessalonica, sends him a letter or something like that, and has apparently told them that Jesus Christ has already come. You guys missed it. They're despondent at the church. There's people upset because they think they have missed out somehow of what was promised, maybe even angry. And Paul tells these poor folks in, in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, the day of Christ, it will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of per perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, this falling away early in the verse there, it's the Greek word apostasia. We get the word apostasy from it leaving a stand for the truth, it's de departing from the truth, leaving good doctrine. The church overall, at the end of the church age, will depart from sound Bible doctrine. It's one of the reasons I, I try to emphasize sound doctrine, <laughs> so that, that you know we can, can put some breaks to that in some places. Any place that I can help, I, I'm plugging a hole, you know. So people don't apostatize and move away from truth. This will allow, because when this happens, uh, it allows the man of sin to be revealed. He, he's also called here the son of perdition. Basically, that means he's a child of hell, the child of hell. He's the son of perdition, the child of hell. This is the Antichrist. It's the beast. It's the coming prince. It's the little horn. He opposes God. He exalts himself above God. And as the Antichrist takes the place of Christ, he takes God's place in the temple. In other words, the holiest place in the temple to make himself out to be God. This is the abomination of desolation. He will demand worship as God from God's chosen people, the Jews, by claiming to be God while taking the place of God in the temple. You can see how this fits perfectly with the description of that little horn in Daniel 7 who's speaking blasphemous words. When that all begins to happen, says Jesus, that's when the Jews need to flee. Now, to round this all out, let's look at the book of Revelation. There's a lot of things in Revelation we could be looking at right now, chapter 13 among them. But let's look at chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. In this passage... The dragon mentioned is Satan. The woman who is mentioned is the nation of Israel. And the child is the seed of that woman. In other words, the Messiah, Jesus. And that seed of the woman phrase comes from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It says here in verses 4 through 6, And the dragon, that would be Satan, stood before the woman, Israel, who was ready to give birth to devour her child, the Messiah Jesus, as soon as he was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Satan had stood near to Israel that he might try 
and stop this seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, who it was prophesied there was coming to destroy Satan and his work. Out of Israel came the Messiah, this male child, Jesus of Nazareth, who would rule all nations with a rod of iron. And Satan couldn't stop him. Jesus ascended as the risen Savior up to heaven in Acts chapter 1, where he then sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And then in this chapter, we see this woman had to flee for her safety. Israel is going to be in danger from Satan working through the Antichrist, as though the Antichrist is possessed by Satan, uh, and that's a possibility. She flees from the presence of the dragon, Satan, who empowers the man of sin, possesses the man of sin, this child of hell, who is now in the temple claiming to be God. And she takes off, takes refuge in the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God himself. And they, presuming that it would be angels, will feed her there and care for her for how long, class? 1,200 and 60 days. One half of Daniel's 70th week. A seven year period where the years are 360 days long. Hmm. Folks, these things we talked about and so much more could begin to unfold any day. The Bible teaches Jesus' return is imminent, meaning he could come at any moment. Once the church is raptured, once he comes, that 70th week of Daniel and all that it entails, so much more than we talked about yet tonight, all of it will begin soon after. Are you ready? Do you know Jesus? It's going to be a terrible time of great tribulation. It will impact Israel the most, but the whole world is going to be impacted by what happens. It's a global government after all. And if you can't see the signs of people trying to create a global government right now, you need to wake up. Don't be woke like they're saying they're woke. They're asleep. Be awakened by the power of the scriptures, the light of the scriptures, the power of the Holy Ghost. The power of salvation of Jesus. You need Jesus if you don't know him. We all need Jesus whether we know him or not. But if you don't know him, you really need to come to Jesus. Because it's all going to be soon. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for your time tonight. We'll hopefully be with you next week when we move into Daniel chapter 10. Take care.